So we're ready now to implement probably what's going to be the most challenging feature of the entire engine, and that is actually Parallel Search. I'm on the Chess Programming Wiki here. They have a really, really good page on Parallel Search, which can introduce you to all of the sort of main algorithms that are used to try and do it. In the contents on the left-hand side here, there's distributed search, shared hash table, parallel alpha beta, with things like the, uh, the young brother's weight and principal variation splitting, and uh, also some other approaches as well. And I highly recommend that you spend a bit of time reading through this list. Probably the most famous approach is something called the shared hash table with lazy SMP. And it's probably in terms of implementation, the most simple as well. What I've understood from reading the, the wiki here and also reading a lot on the forums is despite its relative simplicity compared with the other algorithms, the performance you get from lazy SMP isn't necessarily any worse and certainly not until you get many, many, many threads involved. Before we start coding, we need to take a look at how this is going to work and how we're going to set the code up. So lazy SMP, essentially what happens is you have any number of threads. So I've got three on the screen, these gray boxes here, searching completely independently of each other. Now instantly you might think, well, how can that possibly bring an advantage? We're just doing three times the work for no gain. The advantage comes from the fact that they're all going to share the hash table. And it's actually really surprising how effective this actually is. And the more effective your hash table storing algorithm is, the better the performance of the lazy SMP will actually be. So these threads search completely independently and they access information in the same hash table. That means as they go through the tree, they're going to pick the benefits of each other's search up and therefore find cutoffs quicker and get to deeper depths quicker. Now on the face of it, that probably seems quite simple. We just start some threads a bit like we did with the input and the search thread separation. We just start some more search threads and let them go away and search and use the hash table. However, that brings about a little bit of a problem because they're all going to be accessing the hash table in parallel and we end up with corrupted information. So if you think of the hash table as we have it now, what we're doing is we are storing a key, so a position key, and we're storing some data, some information as well. In terms of how we're going to do this in the program, we're storing our key, which is our position key, which you're familiar with. The data part that we're storing is the move, the flags, the score, and the depth. We're also going to store the age, but you'll see shortly in the code, we're going to be referring to something called data, and that's going to be referring to the move, the flags, the score, and the depth. So if you imagine we have a, a traditional search, we have a transition table with uh, five possible entries, indexes zero to four. And let's imagine the search starts and it's a synchronous search. We've only got one thread searching. There's nothing going on in, with parallel search or anything like that. On line two here, we get the first entry. The key is 32, which means if we modulo that with five, the index is then two. And the data that's going to go in here is 16. So the program stores at index two, key 32 and data 16. Then later in the search, it uh, has the key 64, which gives the index 4, and it stores there the data 21. Now we go further on in the search, and we get key 51 and data 20. Now key 51 will go index position 1, and we'll store there 51 and then 20. You'll notice I've got 71 and 30, and that's because later then in the search, we get the key 71 and the data 30. Now it's the same age, and let's ignore the depth for now. That will then overwrite the 51 and 20 at this index position one here with the key 71 and the data 30. So let's imagine now we've got two threads in parallel. We've still got our hash table filling up here. Thread one finds with key 13, it needs to store its information at index three. It's got key 13 and the data is 99. So this thread stores key 13 and it stores data 99. The problem is there's another thread in parallel with the key 23 that gives it the index three. So it's going in the same place as thread one, but thread two has a data 11. So what could happen is thread one stores the data and then the key and thread two stores the key and then the data. And what you end up with is a key 13, but a data 11. So you end up with the key from thread one, but the data from thread two. And what that means is if you go in later on in the search and just use the key to match, you might end up with the wrong data because the threads have been working very, very fast in parallel and you've got wrong data for the given position key, which means you'll have more than likely the wrong move and you'll definitely have the wrong kind of score or something like that. And that means the performance of your hash table is not going to be very good. So to hammer that home, really important to understand is this the risk if you just blindly parallel search sharing the hash table that you're going to be accessing information for a given position from one thread and getting the data that was stored from another thread with a completely different position. So the question is, how do we solve this problem? And we're going to use one of the most popular solutions, and it's something called lockless hashing. 
if I go to the shared hash table section on uh, the chess programming wiki there's a really really good page actually which describes how lockless hashing works or a really good section should I say here it was originally proposed by Robert Hyatt so Bob Hyatt who's really famous for the crafty engine amongst other things and Tim Mann who actually wrote the original Winboard, um, and they came up with the idea of using lockless hashing to prevent this problem of collisions from different threads and therefore accessing the incorrect information so you can find the explanation of this on the, the chess programming wiki. It's pretty simple and straightforward to understand. You just have to be a little bit careful with how you're storing and then accessing the information. So lockless hashing is used to ensure that the data that you're accessing was actually stored from the position key that you used when you stored it. And the way it works is quite ingenious and quite simple. If we imagine here, we've got thread one and it's got the key 13 and the data 99, and it wants to store key 13 and data 99. Instead of storing key 13, what it's actually going to do is XOR its key 13 with the data 99, which I've tried to put in a table here, and it gets from this XOR the result 110. And it's this 110 that will be stored in the hash table as the key rather than the key 13. The data 99 is then still stored as exactly the same as before. So then when you come to actually access the information, you essentially just do the reverse. Now what you do is you take your position key which is the 13 still, the data that's sitting in the hash table at the index position is this 99. So if we XOR those together, what we should get is a match to the key that we stored, which was the 110, which we do. So we know that this data must have been stored here from some information that came in with the same position key that we have. Now, back at the beginning of this explanation, you remember that we had the example where at the index three here, we ended up with the key 13 being written, but then the data being corrupted because at the same time, a second thread wrote in the data, but didn't overwrite the key. So we ended up with data 11 instead of 99. And this is where the lockless hashing really comes into its own. Because in this case, what would happen is we'd go into the hash table again, we have our key 13, but this time the data there is 11. So we would make the XOR with the 13, 11, and we get the result six and therefore we don't match the key that's stored in that position there because the data XOR to that position key does not match the key that we uh, stored originally which means we know that the data that's there is different to the data that we were trying to store that data was originally 99 and then at some point ended up somehow with these parallel threads all working together being overwritten and that's how lockless hashing works instead of storing directly the key you just XOR the key with the data and then do the reverse when you want to get the information out to check that your data was stored from the key that you're currently using to access the hash table. So the question then becomes, how are we going to implement this in our code? So we're going to store the move flags, score and depth all in one unsigned 64-bit integer, which we'll then use for the XORing operations. So the move, if you remember in the program, is 25 bits. The flags, which can be 0, 1, 2 or 3, are then 2 bits. The score is 16 bits. And you have to be careful with the score because we're using an unsigned 64-bit integer here, but our score values can be negative, if you remember. We go from negative uh, infinite to positive infinite. And that means actually that what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to shift the score by the infinite bound such that all of the scores that we saw are positive otherwise we're going to get a bit of a problem and finally the depth can go up to 63 that means we need these six bits here for the depth so to create our data all we need to do is merge all of these together shifting them to make sure that they exist in different parts of the 64-bit integer so we'll do the score plus this infinite bound we'll merge that with the depth shifted left by 16 then we'll merge that with the flags shifted left by 23 and then we'll merge that with the move shifted by 25. And what that should do then is get all of these existing together in parallel inside this 64-bit uh, unsigned integer. To get them out, what we have to do is to remember basically where they are. So the move is at bits 26 to 50. So we need to shift that right, 25 bits. Ah, you'll have also noticed that there's the cast here for the uint64 and also the integer. So when we start creating this uh, shift here, the move is actually an integer. And obviously we're going actually past the number of bits there are inside an integer, therefore things aren't gonna work. So we need to make sure we cast it to an unsigned 64-bit integer. And then when we get it out, also we're going to recast it back to an integer as well. The flags then we shift to the right 25 bits and and with hex three. The score we shift to 25 bits and and with uh, FFFF, which is 15 full bits, and then subtract the infinite bound from that as well so that we get the negative score we might have had when we stored the information. And finally then the depth shifted by 16 and ended with uh, 3f. Assuming all of that there is correct, what we should then end up with is the data that we originally pushed into our 64-bit unsigned integer. 
In terms of the initial code that we're going to write, it's going to look a little bit like this. We're going to add an SMP key, an SMP data to our hash entry. We're not going to remove the move, the score, the depth and the flags. And the reason for that is I want to write some functionality first to do some sanity checking. So we'll store the data, retrieve the data, but then cross reference it with the original data that we're storing to make sure it's all correct before we go on and actually remove all of the unnecessary stuff uh, from the hash entry and implement the lazy SMP. When it comes to storing the information, we'll create the data as explained with all of these shifts. And then the SMP key will be our position key XORed with the data. And then the data will simply be stored under SMP data. So hopefully that's a relatively clear explanation of what we're going to do. And in the next video, we can uh, cross our fingers and toes and actually start trying to program this into Vice.